who is the bald nerd? Oh, hey, sorry, this is awkward. I didn't see you there. Uh, this week on Category 5 Technology TV, we're going to be getting started with the basics of Microtik routers. It's a series that is going to help you secure your home or office network. And we've got to start somewhere, so we may as well start with the getting started. We're going to be setting up our router for the first time today, and then through the course of the series, you're going to be learning how to harden that network and make things as safe as they possibly can be using a device that is much more affordable than should be possible for the feature set. That's Microtik. Stick around, we're going to get started right after this. Live recordings are trusted only to solid state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in every week on Roku, Kodi, and other HLS video players. For local show times, visit Category5.tv. I'm Robbie Ferguson. Thank you so much for being here with me again this week. I'm in the production studio, AKA The Bridge. The Bridge is what we call it here at Category 5 Technology TV at Studio E. So we're starting a series on Microtik routers. These are a disruptive technology in that they provide features that are only available generally on the market as enterprise level features. So you've got to pay a lot of money to get these kinds of features. Well, these little guys from Microtik are able to do it a lot cheaper. We're talking about 10% of the price. So it is a great thing and it allows us to create a better home network, a better office network, perfect for SMBs or self-employed people. Um, so if that is you or if you just want to make your home network as good as can possibly be, well, this series is for you. We're going to take you through. I'm going to take you through um, everything from the basic setup today all the way to creating a guest Wi-Fi network that is going to allow your kids' friends to use the Wi-Fi without actually risking the integrity of your personal data. There's a lot that we can do with a Microtik router and we're going to help you through that throughout the course of this series. The series is available at cat5.tv slash Microtik so make sure you go there and you're going to see each of the videos plus the hardware that is going to be required. Speaking of hardware, now I have opted for the Microtik HAP AC router board RB962UIGS and the reason that I've opted for this particular model is, uh, well there's a few different things. Essentially it has gigabit ethernet. Now my internet here at the studio is gigabit internet. So if I had a router that only did 10 over 100, I'm going to actually only be getting 100 megabits per second on my internet service, even though it's capable of so much more. So I absolutely needed to ensure that my router is going to support the gigabit ethernet um, so that uh, and the gigabit internet so that I'm not um, losing some of the speed of my internet connectivity. That's very, very important. Second uh, to that, is the fact that it has a dual radio, so 2.4 and 5 gigahertz uh, Wi-Fi. So I can put my cameras on 2.4 gigahertz, which is a pretty oversaturated band, uh, but at the same time I can have 5 gigahertz for my phone and my other devices so that I've got better speed, better connectivity, and uh, it's going to work really, really well. It supports 802.11b, G, and N Wi-Fi capability, all from within this little device that is not going to cost us a whole lot of money. You can find out more about the product line. Go to our website, cat5.tv slash microtick and follow the link. And that's going to take you to uh, an index. So what is interesting, I should say, I've already kind of covered this in the introductory video a couple weeks back, uh, but 
Um, just to be clear, what is neat about Microtik is that it is not limited by software. So the firmware of the router does not restrict you in the same way that uh, a, tr a traditional consumer router would. Um, typically, you have to pay more for more features. Well, Microtik and their router board OS, um, it, they, it is completely wide open as far as feature set goes. So the only consideration as you buy a Microtik device is what is the hardware going to do for you. So you need to make sure that it's that the device that you're buying is going to meet your needs. Is this the right device for you? I don't know. You may be able to get away with a, a lesser one, something a little smaller or a little bit, uh, a little less expensive. Um, and, and you can go through the list of their hardware and figure out which one is right for you. But keep in mind the software that runs it from the very cheapest $30, $40 router that Microtech makes all the way up to the very most beautiful rack mountable $600 unit, the software, the firmware, the capabilities of the programming are completely the same. So the only limitation is based on hardware. So you can start off with something really cheap and work your way up. Later you can upgrade if you need something better. That's pretty cool. So again, cat5.tv slash microtick. The now all that, all that I've done is plugged in the power so far, but what we need to do first and foremost is I need to bridge my internet modem. So my internet service provider has provided um, an internet modem that allows me connectivity. But that modem has a DHCP server, it has a firewall, and it's basically allowing my computers to communicate to the internet. Well, I'm going to replace that built-in firewall and that built-in router with, uh, and the DHCP server with my Microtik. So I need to do what's called a bridge. So the modem uh, that my ISP provides, mine is a Hytron modem, um, I, I need to set it so that it is nothing but a modem. And then we're going to use this device to control it. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to log into the interface and the Hytron modems or CUS admin is the login. Your modem is going to be different, um, so do keep that in mind. Um, it's going to be the IP address of your gateway. You can find out more by um, contacting your ISP if you're not sure how to do that. But just ask them, hey, how do I bridge my modem? That's the important thing. So it is just going to be a dumb modem that gives my Microtik access to the internet. So on the Hytron, I'm going to go into basic and then gateway function. And residential gateway function is enabled by default. I want to simply disable that. Now keep in mind, as soon as I say OK, I'm going to lose access to the internet once I hit save changes. So let's do it um, because now I have turned that into a dumb modem. So let's grab an ethernet cable and let's, uh, let's uplink our router board. So the router board port number one, I'm going to set as my WAN port. So I'm going to connect that into my network. Just get this out of the way. This is a little bit rickety because uh, I'm doing this, you know, um, pretty makeshift, but you're going to get the idea. Uh, basically, port number one from the router board is going to come out to my, my modem. So I'm going to plug that in to my modem here. There we go. Connected and good. Let's see. Yeah, doesn't seem to matter which port I go in. I'm going to just jam that in there. There we go. And now I'm going to take the, the cable that was uplinking me to the network and I'm going to plug this into port number two on my router board. And that's going to give me access to the Microtik. I say router board, Microtik is the brand, router board is the product. So my network, which is my switch, is now connected to port number two. So my computer is basically seeing port number two. Port number one on the Microtik is going into the back of the actual ISP modem, which is now set to bridged mode. So let's jump over to our Microtik. Uh, first of all, we need to see what's... Now, one thing you're going to notice is that I am at 10.0.0.1 .0 .0 originally. 
I need to find out what my new network is now that I am on the Microtech IP config slash all. So this is uh, in Windows. In Linux, you're going to type IP space dash A. And let's find out what kind of networking I've got here. Uh, okay, I'm still seeing a default gateway of 10.0.0.1. Let's see. So it has not refreshed yet. So let's check. So I'm on Windows 10, and even though a reboot could um, trigger um, basically fixing your network by trying to reconnect, all I'm going to do is I'm going to right-click on my Ethernet adapter and disconnect, disable the Ethernet adapter, and re-enable it. And now, once it reconnects, I should be able to do an IP config slash all and should see... Yes! Okay, so we now are on 192.168.88. Dot one. So let's try that. 192.168.88.1. And there we are with router OS. So in router OS, first thing we now this is the quick set. So this is allowing us to quickly set up our Microtik um, router device. So let's see what's happening here. So DHCP server range, I want to change that to 10.0.0.100. To 10.0.0.254. Now you may not need to do that because you may be using 192.168. Whatever. Um, I need to. I here at the studio. I use the 10.0.0.100 block. So that is general networking and not really what I'm setting out to do here um, and and teach you. But essentially, that's my IP block. If you're happy with 192.168.88.1, that's fine. Uh, I'm doing 10.0.0.1 as the IP address for my router and setting the DHCP server range accordingly from 100 to 254. All right, so anything else that I need to set here, I can set up my wireless and everything else. I'm going to do that um, in a little bit. So let's just get our IP address working here. So I'm going to hit apply configuration. Notice the address acquisition is grabbing from Ethernet port number one. That's why I plugged my modem in there and I've set it to automatically get the IP address. So let's see what happens here as, uh, as I apply that configuration. So we should see that that router is going to restart itself. And when it does, we're going to be on a 10.0.0 network. Cheap and cheerful solution. All right, 10.0.0.1. Yeah, there it is. All right, so it was that easy to, to get everything set up. Okay, so let's uh, let's renew our DHCP from this is our internet connection, <clears throat> and let's see what it's given us. Let's release and renew. Make sure, yes, we are on Ethernet port number one. I do not have a live indicator light, so something... Ah, my cable wasn't plugged in all the way. <laughs> that is thing number two to do. So do you see how that just popped right in? Boom! I am live on the Internet. So now I should already have access to, say, Google. Yes, I am online. Let's do a quick speed test. Let's see how she's doing. Go, go, go. So that was a pretty miserable download speed. Upload speed. Not terrible. Test again. Something's up there. Maybe we're just in that, uh, you know, that pandemic uh, internet speed. Everything is pretty slow right now. Yeah, getting pretty low speeds. So even still, a 10 over 100 router would only give me up to 100 megabits, and I'm pushing 156 right now. That's pretty bad considering I'm supposed to have a gig, but it, at least I know that um, I'm getting better than 100 megabits a second. So there we go. 
Everything looks pretty well set. Let's jump into WebFig. Now this is what makes the MicroTik so very powerful. This is the software which you will get lost if you try to find your way through here. And note that that's as quick as it was to get everything up and running, but I am going to need to set up things like under IP, I can set up uh, DHCP um, uh, reservations. So as my devices connect, I can actually set these up as uh, static devices. You'll notice it's counting backwards, so my computer actually got 254. So it's actually starting at the high end of the DHCP pool and working its way down, which is fine. If I wanted to, I could make that static by simply clicking on Make Static. Again, I'm in IP DHCP server. I've single clicked on my computer and I can click on Make Static. I'm not going to do that, but I will need to do that with things like my server when I bring those online. So that is really like really cheap and cheerful, quick setup of my network. Now let's actually get Wi-Fi up and running. So Wi-Fi is pretty straightforward. I'm going to add a Wi-Fi password of dumdum123. Don't actually do that. I'm doing that for the sake of the demonstration. Uh, okay, so network name on two gigahertz. I can leave it as is, or I can say cat5tv2. Point. Uh, I guess I can't. I'm not sure if I can have a point in there or not. I'll go cat5 TV, and then for 5 gigahertz, I'll go cat5 TV 5 gigahertz. Yeah. All right, so see the options here? B, G, B, G, N, B, G, N, G, N. And then we've got A, N, A, N, A, N, A, C, only A, C, and N with A, C. There's my password. Okay, so looks good. Apply that configuration. Now, one of the things that's really, really neat about this, okay, first of all, you notice I'm not having to reboot my router every time, and notice I'm starting to pick up some Wi-Fi um, connectivity here. Um, I, I don't have to reboot every time I change the configuration, and when I create any kind of config, it's instantaneous. So, but what is cool about WebFig, this web interface, so notice I'm accessing this through the IP address of the router, um, is that if I were to brick my MicroTik, and I don't want to lose the settings that I've created, presumably you've backed them up, because you can, within WebFig, that's part of the system. Um, so if I jump into, uh, do, do, I want to say it's in system, system, uh, do, do, reset, reboot, port, see how vast this is? I will find and cover backing up your microtech. <laughs> oh, there's a sup out dot riff file, so that will do it. Um, <clears throat> but if you were to cause a problem that would not, that would make it so that you cannot log into this, Microtech provides a piece of software, so I've just logged out, and you can download and install Winbox. Winbox is a Windows application, it's also available for Mac, and it gives you the interface. It basically detects your router on the network, and it gives you the same interface uh, with a little more uh, functionality, like micro uh, multitasking. Um, but even if you cannot get into the web interface, you can use Winbox. Uh, I say it's a Windows application. You can download it and run it in Wine on your Linux box, so do not be concerned about that. Notice I can log in with no password, so I want to go into Quick Set and just set myself a password on my router, dum dum123, dum dum123, and apply that config. And so now if I log out and try to log in again, it's going to say authentication failed. So I'm going to try dum dum one two three enter. Make sure you use smart passwords, okay, folks. Um, best way to do that is use a tool like like uh, LastPass and generate a secure password. Okay, grab that, make that your password, and uh, and then use LastPass or whatever password manager you're using in order to memorize it, and that's going to keep you a lot safer. Um, of course, the interface is only accessible within my network, so it can be something that's familiar to you as well.
So that is, uh, so we've got Wi-Fi working, presumably. So let's see if I bring up my phone here and drag down. Let's bring up our Wi-Fi networks and you will see Cat5 TV 5 gigahertz is there and ready for me to connect. I'm going to try it, connect to it and type dumb, dumb, one, two, three, connect and obtaining IP address and I'm in done and it's detected cat5 TV the two gigahertz as well uh, and I'm connected so now if I go IP and then DHCP server and go into my leases you'll see that there's a new device that's my phone so I can make that static and I can uh, and notice that is the poco phone poco phone f1 Robbie so it's as quick as that to pick things up be able to configure it and literally we we just set up our internet and got up and running in a matter of minutes what are we going to do for the rest of the show folks what are we going to do so check out cat5.tv slash microtick these devices are affordable they are powerful we're going to learn all kinds of amazing things that we can do with this it's so much better than the built-in firewall and protection that comes with your ISP's modem. It removes the ISP's ability to be able to connect in and access your network. That's important. Think about that for a second. When you install a, a modem from your ISP, your internet service provider, they have access to that. Remember when I bridged it? That made them lose access to it. Now, the only device that they can see if they're trying to track is the the micro tick they cannot access it however they might be able to see just that there is a device connected i could connect another 100 computers they would still only see one device connected so it gives you a fair amount of privacy uh, against the isp snooping as well and that said it's giving you a huge amount of privacy against script kitties and hackers and everything else but at the same time, we're going to be able to create a safer network within our internal infrastructure, which is going to be fantastic. I mean, it's so nice to be able to give out a Wi-Fi password to your friends and family as they come and visit. Um, but you don't want them to have access to the files on your server, to your printer, to uh, using all your bandwidth as you're trying to you're trying to do something online and something's weird. It's running so slow. Well, little did you know that somebody who you gave your Wi-Fi access to is downloading a movie from next door, right? So these are things that we're going to be able to prevent with our Microtech. So check out the series, cat5.tv slash Microtech. It's going to be amazing. And we're up and running. I'm going to put this in the rack. And uh, I'm excited because this is a way better solution for my network. Check it out, cat5.tv slash Microtech. I do have to take a really quick break. When we get back, we've got Becca on deck with the news. Stick around. Welcome back. With this week's top tech stories, here's Becca. Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. There's a black hole lurking within a thousand light years of Earth, and people in the southern hemisphere can see stars circling it with the naked eye. Two terabytes of Nintendo source code was leaked. Facebook trained their AI chatbot using Reddit posts. Tesla has applied to become an electricity supplier in the UK. The POCO F2 Pro smartphone with the Qualcomm Snapdragon 865 has launched globally. And Twitter will allow employees to work from home for as long as they want. Stick around, the full details in this week's Crypto Corner are coming up. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. From the Newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. Astronomers have stumbled across the nearest black hole to us yet. The void lies at the heart of a stellar system just a thousand light years away and indications to its location are visible to the naked eye. 
A team of researchers were observing the HR 6819 star system from the European Southern Observatory in Chile as part of a wider survey studying binar star, binary star systems, and they stumbled across a third object. Spectrographic data revealed that one of the stars orbited an invisible companion every 40 days. Meanwhile, the second star sits much farther away from the first. They now believe that the HR 6819 is not a double system, but a triple system. One that contains two stars that are both around the six solar masses, and a third object that is at least 4.2 solar masses. That number is much too high for the object to be a neutron star. Thomas Ravinius, first author of the study, said, An invisible object with a mass at least four times that of the Sun can only be a black hole. If the researchers are indeed correct, the object will be the closest black hole from Earth discovered yet. Peter Hadrava, the co-author of the research, said the team was totally surprised when we realized that this is the first stellar system with a black hole that can be seen with the unaided eye. As a point of clarity, the black hole itself isn't visible to the naked eye, only the stars are. For those in the Southern Hemisphere hoping to catch a glimpse, it's located in the Telescopium constellation and will be best viewed during a clear night, and two fuzzy bright pinpricks should be discernible without binoculars or a telescope. Although the object seems to have been near us all along, it has escaped detection until now. Not only is the black hole pretty small, it's also very quiet, meaning it doesn't spew jets of electromagnetic radiation, unlike the supermassive ones at the centers of galaxies guzzling up the stars. The team has only managed to infer its existence from the wobble of the stars that orbit it. The team is hoping to capture images of the orbit to further establish the distance and mass of the system's objects. An anonymous hacker leaked around two terabytes worth of source code related to the Nintendo Wii, GameCube, and Nintendo 64 designs. This cache includes Verilog code for the hardware, essentially the coded blueprints for the various chips. While a neat peek into the inner workings of Nintendo and a rare look at the low-level design of the specialized chips that go into consoles, don't expect too much to come out of this. While in theory the Verilog code could be used to turn Clo chips into Nintendo chip knockoffs, the equipment and expertise needed to do that would be very expensive and not the sort of thing a hobbyist could do. And any commercial efforts would no doubt be torn to shreds by Nintendo lawyers. The leak also, apparently, won't be of any use to the developers of emulators who can only legally do what they do by reverse engineering. The developers of the Dolphin emulator say in response to the leak, We cannot use anything of any sort from a leak. In fact, we can't even look at it. Dolphin is only legal because we are clean room reverse engineering the GameCube and Wii. If we use anything from a leak, Dolphin is no longer legal and Nintendo will shut us down. That's not to say there won't be a fly-by-night emulators uh, which include the leaked code, but we'd advise serious caution when considering uh, using any such tool, as it is very likely to include malware or backdoors for malicious use. Facebook has launched a new chatbot that it claims is able to demonstrate empathy, knowledge, and personality. Their chatbot, which they've annoyingly named Blender, was trained using available public domain conversations, which included 1.5 billion examples of human exchanges. But experts say training the artificial intelligence using a platform such as Reddit has its drawbacks. Numerous issues arose during longer conversations. Blender would sometimes respond with offensive language, and at other times it would make up facts altogether. Researchers said they hoped further models would address some of these issues. Artificial intelligence expert Dave Choppin said that Blender was a step in the right direction, but noted two fundamental issues that still need to be overcome. He told the BBC, The first is just how complex it is to replicate all of the nuances of a human attribute, like the ability to hold a, a conversation, a, a skill that most three-year-olds can master. The second is around the relationship with the data used to train the model and the results generated by the model. He goes on to explain, as great a platform as Reddit is, training algorithms based on the conversations you find there is going to get you a lot of chaff amongst the wheat. Facebook also compared Blender's performance with the latest version of Google's own chatbot, Mina. It showed people two sets of conversations, one made with Blender and the other with Mina. 
Conversations included a wide range of topics, including movies, music, and veganism. Facebook said the 67% of respondents through Blender sounded more human than Mina. The researchers noted, we achieved this milestone through a new chatbot recipe that includes improved decoding techniques, novel blending of skills, and a model with 9.4 billion parameters, which is 3.6 times more than the largest existing system. Building a truly intelligent dialogue agent that can chat like a human remains one of the largest open challenges in AI today. All right, thanks, Becca. We've got to take a quick break. When we come back, Robert Koenig is here with the Crypto Corner, and Becca's got more news stories for us coming up as well. Stick around. Welcome back to the Crypto Corner. Hope you're well. Uh, this week, I'd like to focus on information. <clears throat> if you've been more than one week with this in, in this industry uh, and you've browsed around YouTube or any other news outlets, you'll have seen that there is a lot of different information out there and most of that is misleading. Yeah, you've got those maximalists that are uh, pretending that their coin or token is the best one and that everything else is pretty bad. You have got uh, those that are shilling coins or that are trying to sell you something. And a lot of people also have got no clue what they're talking about. So this week, <clears throat> I'd like to focus on exactly that subject. I've been in this industry since 2015. And what you'll see now is a collection of those uh, YouTube videos and podcasts that I follow on a regular basis. Uh, you'll see the table at the end of, of this video. And um, it'll be tabled with the name of, of the podcast or YouTube video. And then in the case of YouTube, I also added the subscribers so that you can find it uh, easier in case there is somebody pretending to be that YouTuber. So let's start with it. Crypto 101. <clears throat> it's a podcast. It's two uh, guys that are doing interviews and uh, about one every two or three days. Um, they're fantastic, those interviews, because they're neutral. Yeah, they don't pretend to be uh, threatening or anything like that. They're just neutral. They're really ki uh, uh, kind, and they get the information that you as a user would like to hear. So Crypto 101, fantastic podcast. Next one is Ivan on Tech. Uh, so that's for us here at Category 5, an interesting one, because he focuses on the coding and programming side. He does seven days a week uh, a YouTube video. So he's one of the leaders in this industry in regards to programming and uh, coding. Uh, the third one is Andreas Antonopoulos. Uh, he is one of the OGs in the crypto industry. Um, 2014, he did a presentation in front of the Canadian uh, Senate. Uh, he does probably five or six YouTube videos a week. And the nice thing for you is that he categorizes them. So it's not just talking about everything. He categorizes them uh, so that it's easy for you to find uh, or see if it's something that's of interest to you or not. Next one is crypto, whereby the O is a zero. It's not an O, it's a zero. Uh, it's a guy called Omar Bam, really nice guy, has been in this industry for an age long time knows everybody and has got f fairly good news. He does it also around every two or three days. Uh, <clears throat> Follow it is uh, Crypto Bud, um, who I rate very high because he is coming from the trading, traditional trading or traditional finance point of view. And he does a fantastic analysis on coins and tokens and projects. He really goes into detail with those and analyzes them, and um, and it's very good what he does. Followed is Laura Shin. I would say she's the only real journalist in this industry, and when she has got somebody that she interviews, those interviews go in depth and um, and are really professional. So I love to listen to Laura Shin's podcasts. Crypto Daily. <clears throat> Is the next one. He is the fun guy of this industry. If you're interested in memes um, uh, combined with some information, then he's the right guy for you. 
<clears throat> if you want to enlighten your life a little bit, then yes, definitely go with uh, Crypto Daily. The modern investor is somebody that never shows his face. Uh, he sits somewhere in Europe and he reads the news as he finds them on all those news outlet, outlet, outlets that exist. Uh, he does it very well. Um, he uh, also uh, gives his own opinion on those. Um, yeah, the modern investor. Next one is Stefan Livera. Um, if that's somebody, if you want to geek out, that's the right person for you. Um, behind Andreas Antonopoulos, I would say he is the one who has got the most detailed knowledge on products, wallets, exchanges, everything. Um, uh, he does interviews and he has always also the top people uh, lined up. So Stefan Livera for the technical people. Box mining, next one, is also um, uh, technical. He was a programmer, a game programmer. He's based in Hong Kong and um, does also very good analysis of tokens and coins. At the moment he mixes a lot of news from Hong Kong and, and China in regards to the virus that is currently going around. And, um, but when he goes to crypto, his knowledge is very good and also unbiased. Last but not least is Data Dash. I would say he's the best one doing technical analysis. Uh, analysis. So if you're into technical analysis, then Data Dash is the right person. Uh, he uh, has got very good knowledge, huge follow base, and, um, and knows and knows the market also very well. So all those here that I just mentioned are those that I'm watching on a regular basis. Uh, I rate all those as neutral people that really know what they're talking about. So that's the ones that I recommend to you. And as you'll see in a second, uh, you'll have that table behind me. Uh, so you don't have to write things down. Anyway, I wish you a great week. Um, all the best. Um, see you next week. Um, and yeah, stay safe. Bye. Thank you, Robert. Just a reminder for you viewing at home, we are not giving financial advice here on the show. However, we're just giving you the facts and letting you run with it. Keep in mind, though, that the cryptocurrency um, market is always changing, always evolving, and is always volatile. So we suggest only invest what you can afford to lose. Now with more of your tech news, here's Becca. Thank you, Robbie. Best known for its electric cars, Elon Musk's company Tesla also makes batteries that store renewable energy on both domestic and industrial scales, and they have applied to become an electricity supplier in the UK. The application was lodged at the end of March with the UK's Gas and Electricity Markets Authority for a license to generate electricity to supply any premises in Great Britain. There has been lower demand for electricity during lockdown as a result of the coronavirus pandemic, with many factories and major businesses um, having to shut down. But electricity supply and demand has to be balanced within the grid for it to function. Being able to generate and store our own electricity does have its appeal, especially if the grid becomes unbalanced and requires the power to be cut temporarily. In addition, Tesla has developed software called AutoBidder that allows customers to sell surplus electricity back to the grid automatically. They use AutoBidder in South Australia, but it's not yet clear if they plan to build similar large battery plants in the UK, which are required to store the surplus. The home version of the Tesla battery, the Powerwall, costs thousands of British pounds and requires a set of solar panels. You may remember the Pocophone F1. Now the Poco F2 Pro has launched complete with the Qualcomm Snapdragon 865 and impressive 8K video recording. The Pocophone F1 was a rare beast and an, an actual example of a flagship killer. Now, almost two years later, it's finally time for an upgrade. The Poco brand began as a sub-brand of Chinese phone manufacturer, Show Me. But with the success of the F1, it was decided that it could stand on its own and they broke it out into its own independent company based in India. Following the F1, they rebranded the mid-range Redmi K30, calling it the Poco X2. Now the new F2 model is essentially a rebranded K30 Pro. 
The POCO F2 Pro brings a long list of improvements compared to the F1, starting with the latest chipset. The Snapdragon 865 is the best chip from Qualcomm yet, and one of the first to feature GPU drivers that can be updated, which might improve the phone's longevity. A lot of emphasis was placed on the liquid-cooled 2.0 tech, with a vapor chamber that in itself is larger than competing phones. POCO says this will enable more efficient cooling. The F2 Pro runs Android 10 out of the box with POCO Launcher 2.0. Dark mode is available, which looks gorgeous on the upgraded AMOLED screen. Storage now starts at 128 GB. There's also a 256 GB option, which we'd recommend since they've removed the microSD slot, and the 8K video can eat up a lot of space. The storage is fast UF, UFS 3.1, up from 2.1 on the F1. The new camera on the, on the POCO F2 Pro may be what pushes die-hard Pocophone F1 fans to upgrade. The phone has four rear-facing camera sensors. The setup includes a 64-megapixel pixel Sony IMX686 sensor. It supports three-time optical, optical zoom as well as dual optical image stabilization. There's also a 13-megapixel ultra-wide angle camera, an 8-pixel mega uh, an 8 megapixel telemac, telemac, this is a tongue twister, an 8 megapixel telemacro camera, and a 5 megapixel sensor. For selfies, you get a 20 megapixel camera on a motorized pop up mechanism capable of just a 1080p video. That's the one thing we'd really like to see improved for vloggers who are forced to use the rear cameras if they want to shoot in 4K or 8K Ultra HD. Speaking of Ultra HD, the more powerful chipset enables 8K recording at the full 30 FPS and 4K videos can now be recorded at 60 FPS. The switch to AMOLED also let, uh, allowed the fingerprints reader to be hidden in the screen. The screen refreshes at a standard 60 Hz, but the touch sampling rate has been increased to 180 Hz. The POCO F2 also has Widevine L1 certification, so it can play HD content from Netflix, Amazon Prime Video, and other services. The capacity of the battery has increased to a 4700 milliamp hours with faster 30 watt charging, and a headphone jack is still included. The POCO F2 is available now through our partners. Head over to cat5.tv f2 to check it out. According to a spokesperson for the company Twitter, CEO Jack Dorsey told uh, employees on Tuesday that many of them will be allowed to work from home in perpetuity, even after the coronavirus pandemic ends. In an email first obtained by BuzzFeed News, Dorsey said it was unlikely that Twitter would open its offices before September and that all in-person events would be cancelled for the remainder of the year. The company will assess its plans for 2021 events, later this year. The spokesperson said, We were uniquely positioned to respond quickly and allow folks to work from home given our emphasis on decentralization and supporting a distributed workforce capable of working from anywhere. The past few months have proven we can make that work. So if our employees are in a role and situation that enables them to work from home and they want to continue to do so forever, we will make that happen. If not, our offices will be their warm and welcoming selves with some additional precautions when we feel it's safe to return. Twitter's new policy comes as businesses around the world are struggling to adapt to social distancing guidelines and rethinking how they will operate in a post-pandemic world. Major tech companies such as Facebook, Google, and Microsoft were early to move to a work-from-home model and have also been the most cautious in planning for moving employees back into the office. Google has told employees that the vast majority of them will work from home until 2021, though some will return in the early summer. Facebook will similarly start to reopen offices after the July 4 weekend, but will let employees who are able to work from home do so until next year. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.tv newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash category5. From the category5.tv newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. Thank you, Becca. We've got to take a quick break. Stick around.
Well, folks, we're still not up to 100% yet. We're doing our best. I'm doing my best here at Category 5 TV. The studio's not set up the way that I want it to be. It's not quite there. Um, I'm way behind schedule as far as how things are going from the live perspective, but I'm doing all I can. And, and we're not quite filling the time and getting everything together the way that I really want to be doing. So we're getting there. Category 5 Technology TV is still here. We're still strong. We're growing. We're, we're learning and we're evolving in our new space. But we're not there yet. So, hey, stick it out with us. Visit our website, category5.tv. Hey, it would be such an encouragement just to know that you're checking out our website, checking out some of those back episodes. We've got 13 years worth of tech TV. Not only that, but we also have some really great features on our website. So if you go to category5.tv, you'll see some new features in the menu bar. For example, we've got a button that says, quite literally, feature. And that's where you'll find today's feature on the Microtik um, router. That's going to be a part of that menu item. And, and well, what does that mean, Robbie? Well, it's a way for you to be able to find content that is relevant to other content. So what that means is as we proceed with this series, you're going to get to see every single video that has been released in that series. So you can follow along. It makes things so much easier. You don't have to nitpick and try to find the right videos and make sure that you're in order. No, it's very straightforward. It's a list of videos that you're going to be able to easily find. So that's just one feature of our website, category5.tv. Thank you so much for being here with us this week. I appreciate you. I appreciate you supporting Category 5 Technology TV. If you're not doing that yet, please go to donate.category5.tv or even better, patreon.com slash category5. That's a great way to support us. Thanks for being here, everybody. We'll see you again next week. Take care. Thank you.